you know, unfortunately, less and less each day driving is a right. And it certainly isn't, and it's never been defined that way, but it's been such an expectation of human life in this world for the last hundred years that, yeah, people assume they're going to be able to drive cars, but we do so in such irresponsible ways with texting and driving and driving drunk and things like that. Do I think within, you know, 25, 30 years, it's going to be illegal to human operate a car in the city of Manhattan or Chicago or LA? Yeah, it's a pretty good chance. We have, we got that many people dying, like maybe it's not a great thing. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 115 of the Andrew Deitch Podcast. If this is your first time joining me, thank you so much. This show is all about having meaningful conversations with the most fascinating people I know. We get to sit down in person and we chat all about all kinds of great stuff. Before I introduce my guest today, I wanted to mention that this episode has been brought to you by Eyes Ahead Media, which is a company that's focused on content creation for brands and really I was just getting overwhelmed with all the work and everything that I was putting into the podcast and I needed to bring on an awesome team who could handle all of the um, post-production work that was really just eating up a lot of my schedule. So I'm really thankful to have Eyes Ahead Media working on this episode. So big shout out to the Eyes Ahead team that's editing this podcast right now. All right, so my guest today is ADP veteran Ed Bullion. Now, Ed was actually my guest back on episode 50, and if you're a fan of the show, you would know that that episode is actually the most downloaded episode of all time, which is pretty nuts. Ed is the former head of sales at Lamborghini Atlanta, and he's the founder of an app called VinWiki, which is basically like a social version of Carfax. It's a free mobile and web-based app where you can add stories and add value to your car's VIN. Um, So basically, you can uh, log all kinds of cool trips, you can log maintenance, you can log anything really, and it's a pretty awesome app, and they've got a very large community of car enthusiasts who um, daily upload different things about their cars and other cars. VinWiki also has an amazing YouTube channel where they have over 670,000 subscribers, and last year, their viewers watched over 1,200 years of VinWiki videos, which is absolutely insane. Their channel is all about sharing car stories and kind of sharing uh, a video version of what people post on VinWiki, which is just awesome stories about cars. Also, if you didn't know, Ed just happens to be the guy that, uh, he's a crazy guy that drove his Mercedes from coast to coast, New York to LA, in the fastest time that anyone has ever done it in just under 29 hours. Think about that for a second. He went from New York to LA in 28 hours and 50 minutes. Absolutely insane. Fastest guy to ever do it. So you might know him from that kind of crazy story. But we actually talked all about that in our last episode. um, And we talked about kind of his upbringing and everything. So definitely go check out that episode if you want to learn more about VinWiki or his Cannonball Run. But on this episode, we talked all about the state of YouTube. We talked about his current car collection. We talked about the Geneva Motor Show and kind of some current events around cars. And we also talked about the future of cars and where we think that the car industry is going in terms of automation and all that kinds of great stuff. This is a really awesome episode. And this episode was kind of just like a full circle moment for me because Ed was one of my first really big guests. He's the most downloaded episode of the Andrew Deitch podcast of all time. So it was really cool to have him back and have him in the new studio. So please, without any further ado, welcome my guest, Ed Bolton. All right. Ed Bullion, how's it going, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me back. Yes, the veteran. I, I would just finish telling you that your episode is the most downloaded episode of the Andrew Deitch podcast. Well, I, uh, I'm sorry to hear that for your other guests, but I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be of service. Yes, and but <laughs> oh. I'm sure you've gotten a lot more views on your own platform since we've since we last chatted. Your platform has grown uh, quite a bit. a bit. Yeah, we're at like 100 million views a year, so on the YouTube channel. So How many years of of video did people watch last year? It was like 12,000 or 1200 something. 1200 years. 1200, yeah, 1200 years of. Yeah, it's it's really really strange. I mean, obviously, we kind of set out with VinWiki to build a useful app, a service, and like any young startup, you've got to figure out a way to market. And our video content marketing strategy of sitting around and telling car stories has been uh, considerably more effective than I ever dreamt it might. Yeah. What it, now that you're you, you've kind of said before, I listened to your podcast you did with Randall a little while ago. And one of the things you said was, I never wanted to be a car YouTuber or this like yeah. public figure, but you've kind of, 
you kind of sh- shot yourself in the foot there a little bit. Yeah, it seems like you've yeah. kind of become that in a certain way, but not the same way that a lot of people do it. I think like guys like DDE and stuff, they're going around like vlogging. You're doing it a totally different approach. Right. And I mean, when you look at the number of views some of those channels get, I mean, obviously YouTube loves the idea of vlogging in any kind of context, certainly automotive. But no, that was never of any interest to me. I, I don't really... I think it'd be a little bit presumptuous for me to feel like my life is so interesting that people need to consume it in that way, (laughs) you know, all the time. So, no, it's been, I I like our style because everybody's got a good car story and uh, the chance to polish them into something that's kind of immortalized, always available, and at least available to so many more people than you'd ever just run into. So I've been extremely happy with the growth, and it's been a a very wild ride. Nice. That's awesome. So obviously, I want to talk a lot about YouTube because YouTube um, is like in the news a lot recently with this whole like demonetization stuff. And I'm assuming your AdSense is like pretty good. Your content is pretty innocuous like it's not like right. a f- you know offensive you're not going out and doing crazy stuff you do talk about some semi-illegal things but right as far as youtube can is concerned it's pretty tame right usually we've I mean, you know we're, we're probably about to post our 500th video and i would say in the course of you know about 18 months of content production we've had maybe a couple dozen that got demonetized mm. and it'll be because of some stupid reason, but it's all automated. So like if you say, I was riding shotgun in this car, and it'll fire off these gun warnings things. Shotgun. So, yeah, so uh. <laughs> like sometimes if I hear it as I'm recording with somebody, I'll be like, well, rephrase that to say as I was riding in the front passenger seat. Because <laughs> that's just, you know, sometimes it'll do it. Now, normally you can hit like review this and they'll always get turned around. Yeah, um, but when you, but when you premiere a video, you know, a lot of those views are coming up because exactly. people's subscription boxes light up right. and you're missing a big chunk of that first hour or whatever. Yeah, and so they change the algorithms about every six weeks or so and you can absolutely see when it happens because the view patterns will change noticeably. Mm -hmm. And yeah, at any point though, the internal propagation of the videos is gonna change after about 48 hours. And so if you don't capitalize on those first couple of days, then it can still certainly get views, but it won't be nearly at the same intensity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I mean, there's a lot of different propositions that people have suggested of how YouTube can change their system, but I mean, I think YouTube's doing a pretty good job yeah. for how much actual volume of content is just being uploaded per minute. Like, it's right. impossible for humans to analyze everything. But And fundamentally, the algorithms are amplifying trends they see. So if someone's presented with 10 videos and more often than not they're going to click on one, that's what's going to be recommended. And so it all makes sense. It can definitely disenfranchise certain content producers and... You know, there are things that might not be as healthy that it incentivizes, like daily content production. So if you don't release content at least two to three, four or five times a week, then it just ends up getting suppressed. Mm. So, you know, whereas if most true cinematographers, videographers can't produce quality that they're happy with on that kind of frequency. Mm -hmm. And so they don't. And... It, most of, you know, I, I got an interview by NBC about a, as an automotive YouTuber of all preposterousness yesterday, and they, <laughs> they were talking to a bunch of people, and none of us had a video background. Like, none of us came from, you know, a film school or anything like that. We all just kind of like cars, and it grew from that. And I think that's consistent, and it's good about YouTube that there isn't this quality threshold that you have to hit in order to really be eligible for strong viewership. And mm-hmm. so... Yeah, you just never know. Yeah, that's that is the interesting thing about like cinematography versus actually being a successful video creator and stuff. <laughs> because I mean, there's videos that are shaky footage from a phone that have millions of views yep. that you know people will sit through, and it's not even edited; like it's all one take. But they'll sit through it because the content is that compelling. Right. And then there's stuff with like insane editing, and it's some of the most like you know objectively objectively exciting stuff to watch but it gets barely any views just because like you know the content's not there the story's not there or whatever they've seen it before you know and that's consistent in any kind of social media content production is that what viewers want to see is authenticity 
And they'd love it to be larger than life and interesting and compelling and something that's just amazing to behold. But most of all, they want to make sure that what they're seeing is a true and honest depiction of what you are talking about. So if your passion for cars exudes through the medium, then it's going to work. Like It may take time. It may take a longer period to develop traction. But at the end of the day, if that's what you're doing people will catch on, they will like it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's working. Yeah, um, and, it, and it's awesome because you guys have kind of created this cast of characters on the show too. Like, you know, you've got a lot of recurring right. storytellers that uh, it seems like a lot of people in the comments are always like, give us more of this guy or give us more from this guy or this guy sucked or whatever. <laughs> How much do the comments play into like what you're actually going out and creating? Because I know you, you film a lot of them in bulk, right? Exactly. Like you'll invite one of these guys out. And in you'll... from out of town and I'll film six, seven, eight videos with them and yeah. they'll have the same shirt on the whole time or whatever. But, <laughs> but who, you know, people, it, people understand exactly. that. Exactly. They get it and it it's what allows us to release the content at the frequency that we have. Because certainly if I had to have a brand new guy that I had no relationship or foreknowledge of every single day that that wouldn't work and you know you always just have to figure out what works and we, I, you know people like to develop sort of a relationship with whoever they're watching on the internet and I understand that and but at the same time there aren't that many people that have more than two or three like really good car stories mm -hmm. and so I don't want to you know out of my selfishness and laziness that wanting to be able to just have, shoot 10 with one guy end up putting out substandard content because it's just easier because I've already got all these pictures and everything kind of edited and ready to go. Uh, but, you know, it's it's just figuring out a system that works. And the great thing is that, you know, with VinWiki, we, we built the app and then we were looking for a marketing strategy. And I think from a small business perspective, the, the blessing that YouTube has been for us is that there always is a way for you to use social media effectively for your business. And it could be a podcast, it could be vivid Instagram posts and influencer campaigns, it could be YouTube, it could be Facebook marketing. Like there's there's so many different things that work well and there's not a prescription for it. Like I can't say that if you have this type of business, this is the solution. It took us about 18 months of kind of trial and error and seeing what, what worked. And you know, I was kind of at my wits end in the middle of 2017 when we started this because you know, the only thing that I knew that like reliably got me new users in our app for people that wanted to document vehicle history and engage with their cars in kind of a social media way was passing out t-shirts at car shows, which is like three to four or five dollars you know, per user acquisition. Which I was like, I don't have half a million dollars to get our first hundred thousand users. Especially because like, there wasn't like a built-in monetization platform on exactly. the app, right? Yes. Like what was your initial I we might have talked about this last time but when you created the app was there an exit strategy was it to get bought or was it to get like what was the I know obviously yeah. you kind of created it out of your own right. necessity and you it was a cool thing for the car community but what was the monetization the, strategy so the the when you have a social app it's best to delay monetization as long as possible because you want to let it become what it is kind of in its own right mm -hmm. you know we we all saw the social network and we hear you know, the conversation between Justin Timberlake and the other guy talking about, like, is it time to put ads in it? And he's like, no, you don't even know what it is yet. And that's very true. Like, the the longer you can wait, the longer your run, runway is before you have to make money off something, the more pure it can become. And so you don't misunderstand what your users want. Because VinWiki was absolutely built around the way I own, experience, buy, sell cars. Like, that's, that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. However that's not a universal approach to it by any means. And so the things that I like to use, some of the users didn't care about. And so we've had to kind of sculpt it a little bit to their preference, but also kind of remain a little bit die hard to our mindsets and our ideas and our values because you don't want to let that entirely change it because otherwise it's just going to become something that already exists that they're already comfortable with. So it would have become just Instagram for cars or Facebook for cars or something. Or just car facts a, or something. Exactly, like a UX that they were already really comfortable in. And so we've 
been a little bit slower to react to some feedback for that reason that we want to make sure people understand where we want this to end up but the end the game has always been yes acquisition i think it should be for someone like us when really there's this threshold of data that we need to achieve that is insanely expensive mm -hmm. and so the better approach is for us to demonstrate our ability to construct a critical mass of users and then sell to a larger automotive data company mm -hmm. and uh, let them kind of use it as a special sauce on top of their existing data set. Interesting. Yeah, because obviously like trying to think of what type of company would even want to buy, buy a VinWiki. Right. You know, it, it would be a company like that. It wouldn't be like Chevrolet probably or something like that. It, you know, we've who had, knows, but... We've had a lot of strange offers over the last two and a half years from auction companies, classified listing sites, other vehicle data platforms and things like that. So they get it. Mm. And you know, you never know when's the right time to contemplate exiting. I mean, right now we're at such a great growth trajectory that there's no real immediate need to do that, but uh, yeah. we got a, you know, we got a pretty good offer last week. I don't think we're not going to take it, but it was, you know, it's good to at least be getting the right kinds of Yeah, attention. you're kind of gauging where you're at cuz yeah. like, you know, Instagram, they they sold for well, I think it was like a billion, billion uh, it was like a billion dollars and at the time people were calling it crazy and people were saying that it was, the, oh man, Facebook lost on this one big time and I don't think anyone's saying that nowadays. No. And people are definitely saying that when Snapchat turned down a billion dollars that they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it was, it was, it's been a pretty interesting few years, especially with like because a lot of people that are creating these apps, their main exit strategy is to get bought by one of these larger companies. But then at the same time, everyone's complaining about how Google and Facebook own their lives. So right. it's kind of a weird thing where the government might end up like stepping in one day and saying, okay, no more buying up these smaller properties. Because that's kind of what they've done with like, you know, AT&T and stuff with like Turner yeah. merger and shit. Like how does that like... How does how do you think that compares in the digital landscape? Do you think that's ever going to happen, where the government eventually is like, okay, Google, no more buying stuff. You gotta you gotta break up. I think the the po the probability of a significant antitrust violation with respect to the internet is pretty low. I mean, the vulnerabilities that would that would exist to like AT and T are considerably more dangerous than like Google. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, Google has access to a lot of stuff, but ultimately. The SEC and other consumer protection agencies don't even have a clue the level of access they've got to our lives. And so <laughs> yeah. it's it's one of those things that you kind of just have to pretend like you don't need your aluminum foil hat and, and let it let it happen. But you know, there's there's an ecosystem of tech startups that that exists because it works. And so you've got layers, you've got these like tech hubs where you can start something with low overhead, low risk. Then you've got these incubators that you can come on, give a little bit of equity, and they'll help facilitate really finding customer fit. And then you've got potentially venture capital firms or big angel investors in most cities that will help you kind of grow through a big seed round. Then you might do a big series A through either a private equity firm or some larger VC firms. And then they're gonna help you market and expand and merge and acquire and whatever they decide makes sense and you become kind of beholden to them. And that's really the arc that most of these startups take. Now, we very deliberately decided to bootstrap VinWiki because it allowed us to not be so beholden to them and not really become just along for the ride in, in our company. And I'm pleased with that. I mean, I, certainly we never would have gotten to the point of having a prolific YouTube channel yeah. if we had gone in that direction. But that doesn't mean that this way is more right than the other. I just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy with where we're at. What do you think the long term? Because obviously, like right now, you guys are experiencing big growth of the app because of the YouTube right. channel. It's like the driver is the YouTube channel, and it's awesome because it also happens to be making money right now. And that's kind of, if I'm not mistaken, that's kind of one of the main income sources of the app it's right now. The right? only one, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yep, absolutely. But it's but it's not bad. I mean, you've got what almost seven hundred thousand subscribers yeah. on YouTube, so it's it's performing really well. It is. In yeah. the long term, do you think that's still going to be the play? Is like VinWiki is just this car story media company almost? So that's been kind of the growing question is, are we a data platform or are we a media channel? And you can, I suppose, theoretically be both, but we yeah. can't be great at being both. And mm. so I've had to explore different possibilities of how we might 
diversify that, lean more in one direction, get some more expertise in to kind of isolate them and let them grow in their own ways. And I don't really know yet what that's going to be. It's it's a fun set of problems to solve, but I, you know, it's it's one of those things that you never really know until you get there. Yeah. Do you ever worry that you're going to run out of your own car stories? <laughs> <laughs> I do have that concern. I, you know, yesterday was my hundredth one and you know, I can do an infinite number of like advice on how to buy cars videos and sprinkle those in. I'd say I have a list of all the stories that I haven't told yet and there's probably another 20, 25 of them out there. Not quite as salacious as buying a Lamborghini from a prostitute or taking a cop on a 190 mile an hour ride in a Lamborghini, but you know, there's still some good ones out there and you know, it's, it's stories, you know, you make new ones every day and, and I think I'll probably continue to try to really, you know, no different than the rest of my life, just engross myself in automotive culture and experiences as much as we can so that I can continue to do that. We've talked about some other forms of content that we might want to release at some point. And I don't know, that'll be kind of just dependent on, uh, on, you know, what the yeah. audience seems to like. Yeah. Cause it seems like a lot of your audience just kind of binges your right. videos. I mean, that's kind of how I end up consuming them. Like I see, I, I consume a lot of YouTube videos and sometimes when I see some videos on my subscription box, those are videos where I really want to like sit down and pay attention because it's going to be, you know, really highly visually engaging and not saying that VinWiki's content right. isn't, but it is a lot of times just something where I'm going to play a, the playlist while I'm cooking or while I'm making breakfast or whatever. And I almost kind of purposefully... Uh, ignore them in my sub box for a while so I can like build up a few new ones so I can listen to like a stack of them in a row yeah or, or whatever I, I think I I could be wrong but I feel like a lot of people are probably you're, you're exactly pretty much in that correct. same boat yeah I mean it seems like we've got out of our subscriber base uh, based on the trends we have about a hundred to 150 thousand people that are gonna watch a video on the first day and then the rest are going to binge through them in some kind of fashion just launch a playlist and go and that's great like uh, it's a it's a really good way for a content medium to exist because you're right you don't really need to watch the channel you can put it on in a background tab and just let it play and a lot of people ask us to make them into podcasts but I, I, there's only so much time in the day for me to produce stuff and, and also that. there's not like the thing that I've thought about because I've, I've thought about that too I'm like kind of I sometimes I kind of wish that VinWiki was a podcast because that's kind of how I consume it sometimes but at the end of the day podcasts don't have that native um, monetization right. you know built in kind of platform that YouTube has like you know as long as you're getting views YouTube will show ads in front of it as long as it's pretty like advertiser friendly or right. whatever and I, we know that the general audience of automotive fans on YouTube are terrific opportunities for us to convert into app downloads. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily know that the same thing is as true. Certainly there are people who would be good, you know, a good audience for us listening to podcasts or on Facebook Watch or on Instagram Live or anything like that. But you know, just we know that focusing on YouTube works. Yeah, so. for sure. Because there's a lot, there's already an automotive YouTuber community on YouTube. So it makes right. sense to kind of just dig into that. Have you, you've gotten a chance to meet a lot of really cool people in that oh, community yeah. too. Are there people that are reaching out like all the time, like, hey, I'd love to be on VinWiki because they know that that can almost kind of help elevate their own platforms yeah. and how do you manage that? Um, I, I get those requests just about uh, every hour. And <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty incessant. Uh, yeah, and I I'm appreciate sure. that, like it's flattering that, yeah. but, but you know, the, the problem is that a lot of the people that send these unsolicited requests of like, I wanna be on your channel, they wanna be on the channel because they see the views and they want to build their personal brand up. And that can happen, absolutely, and we don't really try to you know, stop or quell that at all, but I want a story, I don't want a bio. And so when I get someone who comes in and just wants to say, I'm so-and-so and I do this and this is how this came about and all this stuff, it, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's really interesting, like if it's how a really substantial part of automotive culture began, but in most cases, it isn't. And that's not what our you know, audience isn't generally expecting. And so I'll, I'll, I try to, I, I turn down most of them because I, you know, it's a, there's, a, there's only so much, but yeah. it's, uh, you know, we, we may have to come up with a model at some point that allows user submission that we kind of curate or something. Yeah, because I've kind of run into a similar thing with the podcast. And I think, think with the podcast, because I do it in person, 
it allows a lot of those people that don't actually care about me or my show at all, they just want a free platform. Right. Doing it in person makes them kind of like face me and actually, <laughs> you know. That's like, right. It's I'm not taking advantage of you right now. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not, so, it's not so easy as just hopping on Skype for 30 minutes and banging out a quick podcast, which I don't listen to any Skype podcasts. And, and I think it's just kind of a quick way for people to easily make a podcast. I'm not saying anyone that does a Skype podcast is not a real podcast, but... It's just not the same thing for me. Like I really enjoy the in-person thing. Yeah. And also, it, you know, it increases the people that I know. You know, if we did a Skype podcast, I probably wouldn't be as comfortable just like walking up to you at Cars and Coffee or something. But yeah. now that we've had this face-to-face engagement, it's like, oh, yeah, I know, Ed. You know, we've hung out. We, we talked for, you know, an hour or whatever on my sure. podcast. So it's it's kind of a different feel. But I, I, I can relate where there's a lot of people that reach out that are just like, hey, can I be on your show? And they don't even realize that I only do them in person. And then when they find that out there, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, never mind. Somebody's, I'm doing one in a few days, uh, PKA, painkiller, something or other. Huh. It's like a three or four hour podcast. I don't Jeez. know. They get a ton of downloads, I guess. But I, That's I, cool. I, but it's on, it's one of these Skype deals. They're all over there. There's like three hosts or something. The thing is, is you can do a, sp- a Skype podcast correctly if you're like recording all the audio locally, you know, okay. and then you're just using the Skype as the platform to all communicate. Because uh-huh. there's actually some that I listen to, like there's one that's a technology podcast I listen to, and sometimes some of the hosts are in all different cities, but you wouldn't even know that in- unless they say it. Gotcha. Because they're basically recording into their own local mics and then just using Skype and their headphones to communicate. Uh-huh. So but Skype I mean, isn't the platform that they're actually pulling the audio from. I think this one's on Discord. Oh, okay. Which yeah. I- don't know anything about I know Discord a lot of gamers use it like it's okay. kind of like I think originally it started as like Skype for gamers almost like because there's these chat rooms and um, it, it might be more effective I don't know oh, those other dark corners yes of the internet, exactly right? yeah so what's been your favorite story on our channel my favorite story on Vinwiki, man, I would say, you know, some of those ones, the original ones, like yours that are like, you know, getting a, getting the prostitute, selling the uh, <laughs> prostitute Lamborghini and all that kind of stuff. But recently, one of my favorites was your story about potentially buying the Bugatti that went into the, um, in, what was it, the in Bay the or something? Bay, the yeah. Galveston Bay. That was really fascinating. Actually, I watched the one that Tavares did, um, right. kind of the update to that that you guys released today. Yeah, it's, um, it, this that one's gotten our uh, the most views in like the first few hours of any that we've ever wow. had. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you really never know which ones are going to do great, but yeah. So people that haven't watched that or listened to that, maybe kind of give them the backstory on that one. So I'm always looking out for, you know, edgy cars, especially really cool cars with really bad history that would make <laughs> them not much less fun to own, but a lot less expensive to buy. And about 10 years ago, there was this guy, he was a Texas car dealer, and he had bought a 2006 Bugatti Veyron, and he was, he had it up for sale, and nobody wanted to buy it, and I think he bought it for like 1.2 million, and had it insured for like two and a half, and that tends to cause some bad temptations. And so he was out driving it uh, in Galveston, Texas, and decided to just drive it straight into the bay at speed and he called his insurance and said hey a pelican flew in front of me i got freaked out and i swerved and went in the water and he left the motor running to allow a lot of water to get in it was a real mess and salt water too to, yeah at least brackish i'm not sure it was it was definitely not good for anything rusted out everything and the problem was When you drive a car like this around, very frequently there are people with cameras filming you drive. And so there's this very famous viral video that I think has like 9 million views now of these guys going in the opposite lane saying, oh, there's a... Uh, well, they, what kind of cars yeah, that they call a Lamborghini right. or Ferrari said, or something? I think that's a Lambo, dude. And it, <laughs> uh, and at that minute, it just drives straight into the water. And so this video, no pelican, no pelican. And so this video <laughs> surfaces, and so he gets convicted of insurance fraud. And then he lets this he he tries to convince the insurance to like really tear the car down. So they do some work on it, and the guy that has it ends up. After, as all the litigation happens, he goes to prison for 10 months, gets out, and they sell it to another dealer who still is going to pay the same guy to, re, to fix it. 
That dealer steals a whole bunch of money, declares bankruptcy, but he had this huge loan against it. So there was a bank that loaned him a bunch of money on the car, not knowing that it was in pieces because the title was still clean and mm. there was nothing even on Carfax. Like Carfax doesn't say ran into a lake. And so they thought, oh, it's a perfectly good Bugatti. I think they loaned him like $900,000 on it. And then a lot of banks don't check. They don't see. And yeah. so... After the bankruptcy, the bank repos it, but the guy has never been paid for any of the work he's done in disassembling or storing the car. And so he threatens to mechanics lien the car. The bank ends up just giving it to him. Then he sells it to some plastic surgeon that was going to fix it one day but never gets around to it. Then that guy decides he wants to sell it. And the original guy that drove it into the lake... Rebought it becomes the broker listing it for sale and just puts it on Facebook Marketplace. And so I get <laughs> bombarded. Like one day I will open up my phone. There's, I mean, 500 messages across every platform. Like, Ed, you have to buy this thing. And I'm like, I do have to buy that. That's a fantastic thing. It was a $300,000 car that would normally be worth like $1.1, $1 $1.2 million. Obviously in a million pieces, but supposedly complete. And the claim was that the powertrain was okay. Now, I've always wanted a Veyron. I, I just, I'm fantastic. I tried to buy Tigers yesterday, but it's, you know, it's <laughs> really? one of those, yeah, it, it, he's a little behind on his payments, I think, but it's um, <laughs> one of those things that I, I, you want, I want to find the cheapest one so that I can kind of insulate my financial risk and I, I can float the loan. I can't afford for the car to depreciate or break in a terrible way, which it could do, but. I, I want one and I've made, I've made worse. I don't know if I've made any worse financial decisions than that, but I want to make that bad financial decision. And so <laughs> I, I talk, start talking to this guy and it just becomes a, a mess. Like another mechanic had moved the parts and was holding some of them hostage. The windshield was missing. The wiring harness had been kind of compromised. And so I am not mechanically inclined, at least certainly not to the extent of that, but Freddie Tavares Hernandez, who has a channel of taking derelict and broken exotics and trying to put them back together was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard of. It's the yes. holy grail for him. Exactly. He's like, I'll do the work for free if I can make videos about it. And uh, he, he was very confident he could do it. But the problem was that, you know, I knew I was going to need probably at least a hundred grand worth of parts, which I would not be able to finance. And I didn't know how I was going to come up with that. And then his time would probably take a year and a half of labor that he was okay not being paid for. But if he ever stopped, I'd have probably a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars liability there. And then the day it's done, you've still got this massive problem that you need a $25,000 set of tires and a $21,000 annual service and probably a $60,000 set of wheels. Do you think that Bugatti would still like accept that car to do the annual maintenance on? Because you basically ship it to them, right? For like a, the, for like a the, month or something? There's three US dealers that will service them and they would, yes. They would do the, I mean, they like making money. And <laughs> now if you, you wouldn't like send it back to Bugatti to be like rebuilt or certified or anything like yeah. that. But it's, it's still in theory could become a car. And so I, as I kept adding it up, I'm like, I'm gonna end up with $600,000 in this thing yeah. that I certainly didn't have. And even if I could find a way to get a loan for it and float it along, I was like, you know, for probably a hundred or 200,000 more, just a little bit more, I, uh, <laughs> I, I could probably get a real car. And so yeah. that's become the more responsible choice Although I still don't know how I put that together. Less YouTube friendly though. That's you get a, some good that's stories right. out that's of it. That's right. The, I mean, the, do it for the content. Do it. Yeah, for the views. For the <laughs> for views. The views. I, uh, so, which is you know any of them, and, and that's the thing. But I'm you're not, still able to tell that whole story, which exactly. is still really cool. Yeah, it's, it is. It is, and you know to have Freddie come on and tell his side of it, I, I think uh, we enjoyed. So it's definitely one of those that got away, but. I don't but know. again, at the end of the at the end of the story, he said, you know, in six months it'll be back on the market when someone realizes that he can't build it back, and maybe even yeah. be, be a little bit further along in the building process, maybe a little bit. So who knows? It could be, you know. But the fallacy <laughs> there is that someone else qualified has decided this doesn't make sense to continue. That will not deter Freddie. He will all hundred always believe that anything can be done. And I talked to him initially. I was like, all right, well. If the powertrain was compromised, like what could we do? Could we put a Huracan engine and transmission in it? It would probably fit. You know, like what, what do you do? And he's like, he thought that was impossible. He said, like actually finding somebody to go through and nut and bolt rebuild the motor would be way cheaper than a swap. And I'm like, huh. That doesn't make any sense at all. But I, I don't know. I don't know enough <laughs> to argue with him. But 
<laughs> it's uh, it would have been fun. So I'll have to find something else. I tried to buy a Koenigsegg last month. That which one? Uh, an 08 CCX. That's the only real, uh, other than the newer Agiras. That's the only one you can really drive in the U.S. I think mm. there's 12 U.S. CCXs, and this one didn't have any miles on it, but it had somehow frozen in hmm. New York, and it had cracked the transmission case and the engine block, which seems impossible, uh, but absolutely happened. Like upstate New York or something? Or? I guess. I don't know exactly where huh. it was being stored. Um, and it was owned by this guy who's got a giant car collection. And he had been kind of ready to get rid of the thing. He didn't know what to do with it. It was like, I think the quote from Koenig's was like six or seven hundred grand to, you know, fix it. Um, but, you know, it, that's a real stick. So, that, like, it, it's stuff that could be rebuilt, maybe. Weld the block up and try. Uh, but it was, the guy ended up betting it in a poker game and losing it to some guy. And uh, <laughs> that dude was just using it as decoration in his garage. And he did not want to sell it. Wow. The guy that, that ended up losing it in the poker game was like, surely this guy doesn't have any attachment to it. But he does, actually. So I didn't get it. <laughs> That's a pretty awesome garage decoration. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously like hard parked, as they say, mm-hmm. but uh, in more ways than one. But Many more. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. I tried to buy another poker game lost car. A Ferrari race car uh, a couple of days ago, so that might happen. Still not over. Nice. So what's good. your What's in your current stable right now? What do you, What do you got going on? So I've got the still got the CL that we set the cannonball record in. I've got the S55 we won the 2904 and set the competitive event record in. I've got the Audi, the one of twelve Brock Yates 1985 Audi 4000 S Quattro's that is now back from its latest run across the country and is very 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 sick. Um, and it's hardly worth making right again, but it's pretty to have hard part in its non-working form. I've got the Porsche 993 that I got cheap on rent list, and we're still kicking around the idea of whether or not it makes sense to do a giveaway at a million subscribers, but maybe that, I don't know. Uh, and then my Mercy, the latest one, has been painted, and I'm supposed to pick it up next week. i got to figure out really? if I time to fly out to Verde Scottsdale. Draco, right? Yeah, it is. Kind of the color of your shirt, now, dragon green in Italian, so... I'm very, very excited. It literally, the, second, the passenger door went on a couple hours ago, so I got a picture of that. So it's, it looks like a Lamborghini again. Uh, but it's, it's exciting. I'm, I love those cars, and it'll be fun. I got to decide how to get it back from Tempe, Arizona. That's where I had it painted. And I've, I want to drive it, but the paint's a little bit too fresh to put a clear bra on. Tape up the front, maybe? So maybe, maybe another painter's tape job. <laughs> I, I did that when I bought the last one and drove yeah. it home from Vegas. and. Had the whole thing. It took it takes a long darn time to cover a car in painter's tape, as it turns out. Yeah, I would assume so. You'd have to buy like the extra wide size or something. Right. But and and when you do it for the first time, you think you, you it, it doesn't make sense in your brain to start at the top. So you layer it in the wrong way, so the wind oh. kicks it up and it gets all wavy. It was disgusting taking that stuff off. But yeah, it, I bet it did protect. It. Of course, I ended up repainting that whole front of that car anyway, but twice. Uh, but it was <laughs> it was good. Car. Why did you choose Arizona? I can't remember. Uh, I bought it there. It was already at a shop. Okay. The guy, the guy wanted to sell it, and I had just sold my previous one. And he called me looking to sell it. And he was in the process of doing a few things. The front end needed to be resprayed for some poorly previously prepared rock chips, and it had holes drilled. In I was going to say it was that one, right? Yeah. yeah. The car had been rather unaffectionately modded in a previous life, and so it definitely needed some work. So it was a perfect candidate to color change because he was about to have to paint about half the car anyway, so I'm like, well, why not make it the color that I've always wanted and that Lamborghini made on the car but never brought into the U.S.? Do so. you think that's going to add value once you sell it again? Do you think that's going to be a desired color? Because there's no other Mercy Lagos in that color, right? Especially right. not, yours is a gated manual. It is, I'm yes. Assuming? It's yeah. one of the 27 U.S. cars that are like that, and you know, about right, right. half of them are compromised in some way. So there's kind of the top tier of them, and then there's the driver quality stuff, and this is certainly in that kind of realm but i think it'll be fine i mean it's nice it'll it'll be a good one yeah because a lot of people gave um salamandrin a lot of flack when he painted his carrera gt that um i can't remember what the color was but it was like an, it's yeah, a ruby a, stone a ruby stone red yeah, but it's but totally it's pink absolutely fuchsia yeah yeah it's almost. definitely not a red but it's r- ruby stone red whatever that yeah. is but and then you just dumped it and let you know somebody else buy it yeah uh, so i I don't know what his game is, but uh, well, I do. He, se- it, he seems to not really, I mean, after his whole Senna thing, I, I, I don't know if you've publicly commented on any of this, but 
what was your like you know initial reaction when that happened i know i saw a post on VinWiki about it you know you had the the picture that the firefighter leaked or whatever yeah which was actually the first photo i saw of that whole thing go down it was on uh, VinWiki. It was wild. So yeah breaking the story there generally yeah if something happens like that something weird in a car that it'll be on VinWiki in a few minutes and, and that's a that's a very cool part of the story because people don't tend to know that sort of thing but I, it was weird like Cars don't really catch on fire exactly like that, and um, it was certainly fortuitous in the same way that if the Pelican had been real, mm-hmm. that would have uh, yeah been a thing. It definitely seems kind of sketchy. It <laughs> seems like one of those things, but I don't know, man. Like I, I want to. On the one hand, I'm a consp- I'm kind of like a conspiracy guy, you know. Like I want things to not be like the true story. Like, well, what really happened was this, and the whole because that that's exciting, you know, course, uncovering yeah, the mysteries and tale. stuff. Right. But l- let's be honest, we all know McLaren spit some flames every once in a while, and for sure, these Senna's are pretty extreme. You know, I don't know. Yeah, you're on the ragged edge of technology. Why not? Why could? Yeah, certainly hypercars do catch on fire. But yeah, but it seems a little fishy. It you gotta, was, I, yeah. I gotta admit, it seems a little fishy. But yeah, and you know, we I I get a lot of people that ask, and I actually made a video about it a few weeks ago. Like people ask me, how do you afford all these cars? And you know, my answer is I don't. The banks do, and I have good enough credit to continue encouraging them to let me. Uh, most, but when you see someone who has far more apparent wealth than their position in life would afford them, you kind of have to assume it either comes from somewhere else or they have a lot of debt. And in my case, it's always been that dude's got a lot of debt, and it's healthy enough because I make money on the cars in most cases, or at the very least, it's all generally there when I come back for it. But uh, yeah, with you can assume where the money comes from, and it's correct. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like you, you were kind of mentioning earlier you're trying to buy a car from Tyga. It seems like a lot of the people that are, you know, these crazy supercar owners are either, like, enthusiasts and kind of, uh, you know, I don't even know the right word, but guys like you that are kind right. of just in this, so ingrained in this world and you just really love driving these cars. And then there's also these people that are only in it for the Instagram clout and they only want to have these cars for the pictures, which I think a, a BMW i8 is like a perfect car for that yeah, type of thing because exactly. it's kind of the in-between. But then I think a lot of these guys, they end up getting in these cars and they don't realize how much maintenance is required or you know how yeah. un- un- impractical they actually are to drive what's your kind of i mean obviously you've kind of told a lot of in wiki stories of dealing with these rappers and stuff like that but what do you think like is the misconceptions that people don't really know about driving these types of cars like what would your precautionary tale to be to someone that oh yeah that'd be fun to drive a lamborghini but they really have no idea well most people think it would be really fun but think it's so far out of reach and one of the ideas that i've Mm. tried to evangelize through everything i've done in the car world by renting exotic cars by selling exotic cars and now by documenting exotic cars is that it's actually a lot easier than it seems and to go have to have the latest greatest whatever all the time that's a very expensive ordeal like that that takes either a tremendous amount of work making sure you buy exactly the right car at exactly the right point you get it early enough in its release that you can own it a little while and then sell it and not lose much like that takes a ton of time but if you focus on cars that are four five six years old after the expiration of their three-year warranties and then kind of letting the market adjust for how terrifying it can be to own one as a pre-owned car if you do that with a reliable car it's really inexpensive to own like i mean if somebody wanted to have a lamborghini and you went out and you bought like a 2011 or 12 gallardo lp 550 It's a bulletproof, reliable car. It's comfortable enough to do whatever you want. They're pretty mileage inelastic. Like there's not a lot of depreciation still available. It's never gonna cost you more than six, seven, eight thousand dollars if something goes really, really wrong. And you could finance them for 12 years, which means you're gonna pay about 1% of its value per month as a payment. So you save up 10, 15, 20 grand as a down payment, which most people with real jobs that don't have tons of other vices that are sucking all their money away could. (laughs) eventually manage to do and then you have a $900 a month payment for a Lamborghini that's not going to kill you and I like to me that's is it a lot of money is it a big car of course it is and I'm not trying to diminish that but if you think about the things that you spend your money on you could find that in most cases on some time frame and the worst case scenario is that you got to save for a few more years get a bigger down payment and then have a lower payment and so 
that's what I've always tried to make clear is that there are sort of like ways around the system to game it, to hack it, whatever you want to call it, to have the Instagram awesomeness and the fun of driving and fulfill that passion without having to just be like a catastrophic financial decision. Mm -hmm. If you want to make a catastrophic financial decision, you can buy a Bugatti. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah, Bugatti will gladly sell you one with a smile on their face. That's right. Um, I wanted to ask you about the... It seems like nowadays there's more hyper cars and supercars and whatever like label you want to put on them. I think the, yeah. what is it, the Geneva Motor Show is like right going now. on right now. And it seems like there's just more and more crazy cars coming out every year. I think for the used market, that just means that that's really great news for the used market. You know, the, the guys like you that in five or six years will maybe even be able to buy some of these crazy things. But right. what do you think? Do you think the market's ever going to like kind of like level out? Are they going to have to chill out on making all these new crazy ones? Or is it always just going to keep kind of getting more and more extreme and building more and more cars? It's hard to say. You know, we were a few friends of mine were sitting around a few weeks ago talking about how many million dollar cars there are on earth and the estimate that we made for today was around maybe a hundred hundred fifty thousand which is a ton like yeah when you compare it it's pretty absurd right and we thought that back in like 2003 essentially like the day before the ferrari enzo was released that it was like maybe a few thousand so the number of million dollar cars on earth earth today versus back then is radically different and the and you know you can blame it on inflation or something it's that's not valid like there has not been nearly enough inflation over the last 15 years to turn a two hundred thousand dollar car into a million dollar car it's about a hundred percent different so maybe a half a million dollar car but even then there weren't half million dollar cars like there were a handful of legitimate million dollar cars back then but that's a very new phenomena and now if you look at the production that's represented at Geneva today of cars that are over a million dollars. I mean, that's there's thousands and thousands of cars that are going to be released in the next 18 to 24 months that are well over a million dollars, many over $2 million. This new Bugatti is 13, 14, the most expensive new car ever built. 13 or 14 million? Yeah, it's a one-off. So essentially you're internalizing all the development cost into one unit. Like if they made yeah. 10 of them, they could be 10% and it'd you know, be the same kind of thing. But regardless, the the, the Bugatti Devo, oh, sorry about that. It's all good. Um, the Bugatti Devo is, at 5 million euros is the most expensive car to ever be built. And it doesn't have a single accolade like it's not the fastest car ever like the veyron was it's not the fastest around the nurburgring it's not the fastest zero to 60 it doesn't have some new technology that no one's ever heard of before so like but they're sold out wow. and people are trying to flip allocations for a million bucks over msrp so obviously <laughs> there is a demand for it and there aren't a lot of examples of cars that are over a million dollars new becoming worth less than a million dollars like mm. it does happen but very infrequently they like if they go, if they go up that high they tend to stick because in general they have a reason to be that expensive that would exclude other buyers like veyrons are a perfect example because there aren't a whole lot of other cars that have maintenance to that degree career gts are kind of close but there there's you know generally you can manage to own them for a little bit less but you if you can't pay a million dollars for one you really can't afford to maintain it so like i'm in that boat like i i cannot afford it but i could probably get the debt to buy one but i can't afford to drive it on a regular basis mm -hmm. unless i figure out some weird solution so that keeps people from lowballing them because like oh shoot what if they took my offer i'd have to figure out a way to afford it and yeah. so it's you know it's kind of the complete opposite of the like Maserati phenomenon, which is that the cars are so catastrophic to maintain that that causes depreciation. So there's almost no money that makes sense to buy like a 2002 to 2004, yeah, you know, 4200 GT. So yeah, you never know. Yeah, I actually remember when I was like in the market for my, one of my first cars. Like I was looking at some used dealerships near my house. And there was like an old Maserati there. And I'm like, how sick would that be for me to roll up to class in my That's Maserati? Right. And I'm like, it's only like 6,000 bucks or whatever. But then you're like looking into all the hidden costs. That's it's right. like, yeah. you, those are things that you don't really realize. And that's the case with a lot of like 
expensive looking things is the hidden costs that you're not expecting, especially with cars, but even with like cameras and stuff. Like you buy a really expensive camera and you're like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. But now it shoots 4K and it takes up five memory cards where your old camera, you know, you could slap one in there and record for days on it. So it's Absolutely. like, there's all these hidden costs that always come into play. Yeah, you never really know what it, what's gonna develop. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, I mean, it's a, it's an exciting time to love cars for sure. Definitely. And the number of expensive cars being sold is certainly a terrific indicator of the health of the economy. The hope is that that continues, uh, but you never know. What do you think about? Car I mean, because for example, the the Chiron or Chiron, I don't know exactly how to say it. The Bugatti Chiron. They one of the things they did was they tried to make it as like timeless as possible, right? right. Like, so I'm pretty sure they even have like a. Like the clock is just like a you know an analog clock. clock, and yeah. there's no screen in the dashboard, and all this stuff, which I really respect, because uh, you know I've always had used cars, and I uh, really appreciate it when a when a company puts into thought a little bit of thought into how is this car going to look and feel in five or six years, you know, because a lot of this stuff, you know, we've all been in cars that have these god awful screens that just look terrible, yep, and it's like they, no one even uses them. We're all using our phones for GPS and stuff, so who cares whether I have navigation or whatever in my car some people love it some people you know don't use it but what do you think you know f for some of these cars that are coming out these million crazy dollar you know cars that are at geneva right now being released how much do you think these companies are thinking about future proofing versus zero yeah because yeah. i mean it feels like a lot of it they're just kind of they know that they're in that market right now and they're just cranking these things out as long as people are wanting allocations and that's always been the accusation like to ferrari of these guys don't care about the customers that are going to buy the car second because mm -hmm. the car is going to be out of warranty they don't have any obligation to it that's why they put all this cheap plastic in that erodes and gets sticky and all that junk but now they're kind of all there. I mean, even Porsche of all insanity. You know, these like the hybrid packs in 918s are not going to last very long. They can't. No, there's no precedent of like an electric powered automobile lasting very long, and certainly not in this kind of iteration. I mean, the technology is already five, six years old that's in the cars, and there's plenty of examples of these cars that don't get driven because people buy you know million dollar cars and just park them thinking they're going to appreciate well if you don't keep the battery charged and discharge it it loses all its range and it didn't have much range to begin with but that means it's not working and it's just this big heavy thing that's attached to the car so unless they build a way for people to go in 10 15 years from now and 100 percent delete the hybrid systems from mm. 918s LaFerraris and p1s I don't know how they're going to manage to keep the cars valuable because that's going to be the liability. You know, 10, 15 years ago, the liability was rudimentary single clutch sequential gearboxes. And people started to think, you know, if I'm going to buy the whole spectrum of Ferrari supercars, I really don't care about the Enzo because the gearbox is so bad, I don't really even want to drive it. And, you know, it's not miserable, but compared to like, a you know, the cars that were built three, four years afterward, it's terrible technology <laughs> and so it's like well what what is that gonna mean and i don't know it's it's honestly among my favorite things about my lp640 is it's got manual seats it doesn't have to drop the glass to open the doors it's got you know it doesn't have an adjustable suspension that's gonna fail everything is just simple it's a naturally aspirated big motor with a reasonably low specific output there aren't that many but there's a lot of space to work on it if you want to and you know, it's just, it's a cool car that is timeless. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it was a perfect example of Italian mindsets because that was really designed before Audi took over, even though it was released 10 years later. And the car, like for the infotainment, there's a void for a double DN uh, uh, radio. So if that breaks, they're always going to make them that size. So you just get, get a new one and put it in. Like they don't care. Like they didn't want to put it in there anyway. Yeah, and exactly. Like, you know, Isn't it like a lot of them have like Kenwood? Like yep, yeah. they're all Kenwoods. Yep, there's yeah. three different ones: 07, 08, and 09. And uh, yeah, exactly. It's got it doesn't have that many buttons. Yeah, it's just a you know analog dash like stuff that's gonna work, stuff yeah. that you could fix. That's kind of the the 
thesis of like Lotus back in the day. I feel like yeah. one of my favorite videos from Vinwick is you talking about how the best way to sell a Lotus to someone <laughs> is to try to convince them otherwise. Yeah. Like, yeah. cause you're, you know, it, the seats are going to become, oh, perfect. That's, that's exactly what I want. Like people are literally buying this cause it's impractical. It's, they're going to be their fun car or whatever. Yeah, and there's this martyrdom complex that goes with it. And I love that. Like, I love how useless some of these cars are in the context of being cars. It means like, if you want it, it's because you want that car. And Lotus mm -hmm. owners are the perfect example. V12 Lambo owners are very similar. Like, no, you can't see out of it. No, there's no place to put <laughs> things. No, it doesn't get more than seven or eight miles per gallon, but that doesn't matter. Like, stop caring about that stuff or go buy something else. But Lotus yeah. guys, yeah. Oh, it's, you know, all this race car construction and really expensive parts and consumables and everything. It's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I want. They I, want, want I want that life. I want that Lotus life. And they get it. They, yeah. They get it. One of my other favorite videos that you did was, um, when you were talking kind of about this almost like secret club of you know ownership of these crazy cars like you kind of got to get in good graces with these companies which is really fascinating because i think the average person is like well if you want a mclaren just go buy it or if you want this like you know if you want the 14 million dollar bugatti like just walk up and give them 14 million dollars but it's not that simple because they won't just sell these to anyone, and do you think that that's ever gonna like regulators are ever gonna have to like step in with that kind of stuff? Because it seems like kind of weird. Like they can pick and choose who they're gonna sell to based on like, okay, you want this new Ferrari, you must own all of our other Ferraris. Like that seems right. like a very weird thing. Do you ever, yeah. Well, anytime you've got a product that is in such high demand that you get to be selective as to who you sell it to. You, that is your prerogative as a merchant to be able to say, like, we're only going to sell these to people who meet whatever criteria. And whether or not it's entirely subjective or not, there is some basis in a criteria to say, no, you're not qualified and yes, you are. Now, in, in all reality, the yes, you are is a much larger set than the number of cars they're going to sell. And so that was why I made that video is that people assume if they just, if they can afford to buy cars, that as they start, they're just ineligible to ever get to this point because certainly Ferrari, Porsche, everybody has the number of great customers already that have these cars. So as they make more, like you can't break into it. And that's, that's not really the case, but you have to be very strategic. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of comments on that one like, oh, I thought this was going to be some way to afford them without like being rich. I'm like, well, if you want to buy a car that's $1.3 million, how were you planning to accomplish that without being rich? Um, you can finance them, but that is so. I thought this was going to be a pyramid scheme video. That's it. That's it. That's what they wanted. Like I really wanted the scheme, not a not the truth, but they couldn't. Handle no, but it. I thought that was really interesting because um, when I went and visited the Lamborghini factory a few years ago, I remember like walking through and and seeing there was a couple that had very like specific bespoke crazy specs and the tour guide would point them out like oh yeah this guy wanted like a pink interior or whatever oh yeah and because now that automakers are letting you kind of do that like the you know paint the sample stuff and all the crazy um bespoke whatever um it it, it makes you stand out as a customer to like have these crazy examples like right. the most expensive example of their cheapest car or whatever uh, absolutely yeah and it's all profit. It's not like the pink leather costs 10 times as much as the black leather, but no. they will charge you for it. Of course. Absolutely. Of course they will. Yep, the R&D so. and, and they had to switch the leather from the machine. Yeah, like chins. somebody had to pick up a different spool of thread, and so they're <laughs> going to charge you 3000 bucks. It's, it's amazing, but at the same time, it works. <laughs> like if you, if you want to become noticed, it is a great strategy. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's no different than what we're doing here. Like if you're going to build social media content, do it a little bit differently and it will work. Do exactly what everybody else is doing. It probably won't because you'll yeah. just blend into the noise. Exactly. And so I think it's a good lesson despite being somewhat counterintuitive that if we take this idea of really making something our own, it can allow us to have a much broader opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense because the only other way is just to buy the most expensive and, you know, the Nobody odds of cares. you getting into that or, you know, whatever. But one of the, I, I want to talk to you about Geneva a little bit, Geneva Motor Show, because sure. that's happening like right now. This podcast will get released like pretty quick turnaround, so it'll okay. still be relevant. But I know that... Um, a, f a few of these automakers are coming out, like Koenigsegg just came out with a new car, and um, 
like I, I know that you know you said the new Bugatti is the most expensive car. Do you have any like interest in that kind of stuff? Because I know you guys don't really make content around those um, things. Your content is a little more evergreen. But right. what is your th- what are your thoughts on like? Would you ever go to one of those shows? Like what what do you think about all this craziness? Well, I mean, as a car enthusiast, yeah, you, it's worth going to those types of events because it's just amazing to behold. And even if you're not out there trying to decide you know, as a customer, which of these am I going to buy next? Like, it's still awesome to be able to dream and to have these crazy goals. And, you know, a lot of us are actually guilty of dreaming too small in the things that we, that we want. Hmm. And I, you know, I remember the first time I bought my dream car, I was like, I must've been 29, 30. And I was like, well, now what do I do? Like, I don't want anything else. And it's kind of a weird thing. And materialistic goals are obviously very shallow, but for a lot of us professionally, they carry us through the grinding times of like, it's worth doing this thing I don't want to do to make money so I can buy this thing I want. And I, there's plenty of other great reasons to do things, but I, I remember <laughs> kind of hitting that wall. And I think going to events, doing interesting things like that in the automotive culture allows you to kind of just keep that dream alive and just feel like you're a part of it. Because again, it's it's not like dislike anything else. Like you can just buy a ticket and go to Pebble Beach. You can go to Amelia Island. You can go to Geneva. Like it's it's all available. Yeah. Yes, there's not some Goodwood is actually really, really cheap. Absolutely. I yeah. went last year, it was awesome. Yeah. All amazing experiences. And you should, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, do, does it I, I do love the uh the Aston Valkyrie. Uh, I think that's as cool, I, I can't possibly imagine what it'll be like to keep it Do running in 10 years. Do you think you could fit inside of it? It doesn't look like it. I, <laughs> I, you know, Clarkson's about an inch shorter than I am, and he's famous for saying it, that uh, I can fit in anything that I want to. And mm. so by that approximation, 100% I'm driving the thing. But uh, there are cars like Esprits and Vipers that make me not believe that that's true. Um, I mean, of course, you know, if I sit up straight in my Lamborghini, my ears against the roof so you know you develop your right nice little slouch and it you know whatever it's worth it yeah exactly isn't i'm pretty sure on the valkyrie too the seat is bolted like you can't move oh, yeah, the you can't seat move it. yeah you're just Did moving the, 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 the pedals the come towards the you or yeah. whatever the other thing that was interesting it, i remember because it's got so many crazy channels in yeah. the inside of it they had to make the cockpit so tiny um I was I I heard that they were doing fittings almost like they had these people that had allocations, but they were they were they were doing these tests to see if you could even if you were fat or whatever you could even get in it to see if you even wanted it anymore. Right, which and, is pretty hilarious yeah. to have a test fitting for your car. Well, and <laughs> and you know as you get capable of buying at that case I'm about a three million dollar car. Um, in most cases, they're not planning to go put a lot of miles on them. So if they don't fit, they'll be like, oh, don't fit. S- send it to my house and uh, I'll stare at it and then I'll sell it eventually. Yeah. So they don't really it's a care. It's value. But, but yeah, that car's got so much F1 technology that like to properly use it to get enough heat in the tires and heat in the brakes to work the arrow and go fast enough to be able to stop hard enough is it's not easy. Yeah. And it, you know, it'll be road car-ish enough. But I'm also really curious to see like how much they're going to have to add to it, you know, like the Chiron rear bumpers that you that are just like stuck on there that everybody takes off the first day. Like, I'm sure there's going to be some of that that Valkyrie owners have to take off because mm. they're, you know, because they have to make it legal everywhere. Yeah, that makes sense. The other thing um, about the Valkyrie is that it was like co-produced by Red Bull, right? right. Like that was like a weird conglomeration that happened. It was their first like, I, I mean, Red Bull sponsored racing teams before, but like. It was officially like a partnership with Red Bull. What do you think about that? Like, it's I think it's weird. a very interesting peek into the behind the scenes thing that is auto racing. Mm. Because auto racing, like everything else we've talked about, is not the path to doing it is not what you think. The path <laughs> to being a prolific car racer is having a lot of money. And they are most of them are paying their way. Now, yes, they can drive cars well, but uh, you know, driving a car is something we're all capable of doing. Driving a car at that level is a special thing, but you can teach it, and people do. And so, like, you see, I mean, half the NASCAR field's paying to be there. They may be paying another company to pay the team, so as a sponsor that they bring, but, I mean, it's all, 
very, very like arm's length kind of deal. And also like a lot of the racers in NASCAR, like their dad was in racing and that's how you get it. Because it's an expensive sport to just get into. Like right. you don't just right. accidentally fall into it. Like, you know, you could pick up a basketball and shoot it and realize you're good or whatever, but you don't just accidentally get into a race car and figure out you're good. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so they've been karting since they're kids and all that. And and it's a great skill and there are great career opportunities where you can have a ton of fun and make very little money for a very long time in that part of professional driving. But what that shows is that Red Bull is the team. Like, mm. they're paying all the bills, so they have the engineers. And so they have all this capacity that they're not always using, and so they have the ability to contribute in massive ways to these cars. Mm. And so it's like you have to follow the money to understand how it's all working, and they've put so much money into action sports and particularly high power car racing that they have the ability to do that. And so huh. I think we're going to see more of that that where the money is available they're able to do, you know, some pretty insane stuff. Yeah, because obviously like Red Bull as a company when when people think Red Bull, their first thing is the the drink probably. Right. And then also probably action sports. Like I think of the Red Bull design on a bunch of the side of like rally cars or like skydiving videos or something. Yeah. Same thing kind of with GoPro. They make cameras, but they also have sponsored all these crazy videos of people doing ridiculous things. And that's kind right. of what you think of when you think, do you think kind of in the same vein of VinWiki, VinWiki is an app, but it's also a YouTube channel do you ever see VinWiki going into another, you know, field that you, you right. know, haven't yet? I mean, you never know. Like, I never would have expected us to have a YouTube channel. So, I, I you can't guess, you know, is it going to be events? Is it going to be clothing that we sell more? Like, you know, as you never know exactly what's going to, to stick. Mm. And I, I think you have to have an open mind because so few companies use what their original ethos was to you know be successful in maturity it's like college degrees like you check the box you start the company you get the college degree and then you wind up doing something completely different yeah. with whatever you thought you were doing yeah and exactly so. yeah i think there was a i actually wanted to check this on the new valkyrie i i haven't looked very closely enough but I really wanted them to put a single Red Bull cup holder yeah. in the oh, Valkyrie. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, the tiny uh, someone, can. Someone mentioned that, and I was like, that would be the most genius marketing if in all the pictures and whatever press they do around the car, if they just had a little Red Bull can sitting in the front console. Always. Something tells me that they didn't do that just because of, in, of how tiny that cockpit actually is. I know, but you could make it collapse like an old Porsche cup holder. That would be a fantastic idea. That would have yeah. been the most genius cross promotion thing ever. But If that um, was the stipulation that every time the car was shown, it had to have a little Red Bull can and like a color coordinated scheme or and whatever. If it, and if like when you bought the car, you got like a 24 pack of like Valkyrie specific Red Bulls oh, and like yeah. when you sold the car, if you had the original 24 pack with it, it would be worth more and stuff. Like that would be so genius. That but. Would be. I don't know if uh, I don't think they went that far. They didn't. I didn't no, see them discussing that any of that. that but come out yet. that would have been pretty sweet. Or like a specific, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it would have been a great crossover opportunity. That's where my brain went. But it's um, clever. I know Doug stuff. DeMuro is kind of obsessed with those types of things where, you know, when he reviews a car, if it's got the original yeah. manual and you can find something weird, I'm sure that would be the most Doug DeMuro quirk if he reviewed a Valkyrie that had the original 24-pack of Red right. of Valkyrie Red Bull. <laughs> the, uh, he, he posted on Instagram a few minutes ago that he's driving, a McLe he's driving Jay Leno's McLaren F1. Oh my gosh! Uh, like, I've known Doug for you know a decade, and I was like, that's the first time I was like, man, I'm jealous of this guy. That's God, amazing. Like, that's amazing. I, I I would eventually love to have Doug on the show. Like I I love Doug's videos because they're so weird and like he's such an interesting guy and he's just he's just very Doug and that's kind of like right. what you were saying earlier. The more you can do something without expecting to get paid tons of money, like he was kind of just do, trying this car YouTuber thing. He was trying to make money. Right. Trying to be a he was doing blogging and all this stuff and not really ex realizing where it was going to go and you know it's just taken off like crazy well he and i were friends and i had talked to him about cannonball kind of before and after we did it and he was writing a few freelance articles a week for jalopnik and 
he said, you know, hey, can I be the first to break the story on your record? I said, absolutely. I'd love for you to. And CNN had asked if they could, but I said, no, you can run it one second after his goes. And actually CNN ended up almost mirroring his article. And so... Without knowing or did they um, look at his article? They uh, No, they, they looked at his, used a ton of stuff from it, published a few hours later wow. and, and referenced it, like giving him credit, which oh, nice. was amazing. And That's so great. in that week, he's like, we may look back on this and say that this this was the article that kind of changed the trajectory of his career. And it was because a week later he had jelominate.com slash Doug DeMuro. And then not long after that, he started his YouTube channel because Jalopnik, like many different, you know, traditionally minded companies, failed to imagine that the biggest opportunity that they were giving their writers was not 150 bucks an article. It was the chance to expose their own social media brands to their audience. Mm. And so they Doug builds up his channel initially through saying, hey, I, wrote, I did a video about this article that I just wrote. And Jalopnik loves it because their ad rates go up because people spend more time watching a native YouTube channel within an article. And so it's like, you know, if, the, if only they had known to not let him and Freddie and everybody else not publish content externally, mm -hmm. like it would have radically changed. It was like yeah. if Lamborghini Atlanta hadn't had known not to let me brand Ed Bolian as the guy that sold all the Lamborghinis in Atlanta, like it would have helped their brand considerably more. Totally. But they, just, they didn't imagine that was going to happen. Yeah, I know um, there's a big YouTuber named Linus Tech Tips, Linus, and he does a lot of like PC builds and stuff. And he got started that way where he was working for a company that no longer exists, but he had Linus Tech Tips as a segment or a channel within their brand. And then when he left the company, he basically bought the YouTube channel for $1 from them. Just so that he and but and it was a stipulation that he also had to keep hosting and um, helping them with their YouTube stuff. Okay. But he bought his channel from them for one dollar. Now he's one of the biggest YouTubers on the on the platform or whatever. And he has multiple <laughs> channels and he's become this whole personality. But right. It's genius because again, it's like one of those things where they didn't see that Linus was the value. They just saw that the content was the value. And right. um, I think that. Uh, Obviously, you kind of are synonymous with VinWiki at this point in time, so right. I don't know if, you know, it, it, that you're still Ed Bullion and VinWiki is still VinWiki. You're kind of like merging, but if that ever, you know, you know parts my hope, ways. My hope is that that doesn't remain the case, that, I, you know, I, I want to be where VinWiki came from. I don't have to be where VinWiki goes, mm -hmm. and obviously we have tons of great storytellers that participate in our channel. And, and I want that to be at the forefront. I mean, I don't mind making a video a week about whatever I'm doing at the time, but I, I, I really want to make sure that it, it's always looking towards whatever it can be, you know, it, yeah. that it, so that it's not limited by my vision or my personality. I want to talk about like the future a little bit too. Um, the future, not only of just VinWiki, but the, you know, Kids growing up these days are not, you know, as excited about cars. Either they are really into cars, or they don't get care at all, and they'd rather ride in an Uber. Right. You know, and you've got these companies that are making these self-driving cars that are, you know, if you've got a self-driving car that comes and picks you up or whatever, you know, you don't have a driver's license, and you never had a driver's license, you never get to experience how fun, um, you know, a traditional fast car is or whatever. So it seems like there's kind of this splitting sure. of the economy, the, the the people that would rather not even think about driving and they don't even care, they just need to get from point A to point B, right. and the enthusiasts. You know, eventually the, these people are going to get farther and farther apart. Again, you know, I've, I've asked you about, like, you know, regulations and laws coming into play. Do you ever do you think that driving is ever going to be illegal like oh, do you, yeah, you know for sure what do you um, where do you see all this you know coming to you know we unfortunately less and less each day are in a position of leverage to say that driving is a right and it certainly isn't and there's never been defined that way but it's been such an expectation of human life in this world for the last hundred years that yeah people assume they're going to be able to drive cars but we do so in such irresponsible ways with texting and driving and driving drunk and driving distracted and things like that that yeah i mean it, we are kind of losing the prerogative to say 
we deserve to be able to do this. And perhaps my speeding is no different. But at the end of the day, we, we, are, we don't necessarily have the grounds to say, like, you can't take, you know, pry this steering wheel from my cold, dead hands anymore. And as much as we'd like to think that it's going to be incremental, we're talking about some pretty big steps in autonomy. And, you know, it's there's some breakdowns in the ways that autonomous and assisted driving are being implemented that probably need to be smoothed out in order for it to be uh, something that's really palatable and acceptable and able to propagate throughout the industry. Because if you don't really standardize exactly what every word that's used in this context means, then you're probably not going to be able to limit it or enforce it or encourage it in the most efficient ways possible. And so what I'm excited to see is how that plays out. Mm -hmm. How do we standardize vehicular autonomy so that it can be acceptable to enthusiasts and it can be also acceptable to policymakers that are just trying to keep people alive. Like, yeah. I mean, we sacrifice a lot of people's lives in order to be able to drive cars. And it's it's just part of a very, very, you know, it's a controversial thing. It should be. Like, we if we got that many people dying, like, maybe it's not a great thing. It's something that so many of us define our lives by that it does threaten it. But it's no different than other technologies that become modernized, changed, whatever. And so I'm hopeful that we'll all be able to find it, you know, and I, and I hope, I mean, there will always be rural areas where you can go out and drive, certainly in our lifetime. Especially, but, and also tracks exist, like, you know, you can exactly. drive fast on a track. But, you know, a lot of the guys that I know that have like 50, 100 car collections are really starting to pare them down to the cars they know they want because they see on some fairly realistic time horizon where there will be limitations. Whether or not it's illegal or whatever. I mean, do I think within you know, 25, 30 years it's going to be illegal to human operate a car in the city of Manhattan or Chicago or you know, in town in LA? Yeah, there's a pretty good chance. I mean, that, that's reasonable to assume. You know, it's not like... How do you think they're going to fizzle that out? Like, you know, is it going to be kind of a grandfathered in sort of thing? Like, I feel like at some point they could say all new cars have to have yeah, a certain so level of autonomy there. or whatever. Kind of like what they did with seat belts. You know, it's like, you know, old cars are grandfathered in. They don't have seat belts. You don't have to wear it. But, you know, if your car is, you know, this older, same thing with emissions or whatever. Do you think it's kind of right. kind of go on that trajectory? Yeah, I, it, that you'll have to get to the point where... You know, now most cars that are sold that are very expensive have at least most of the capability built in that they could drive All themselves. All the cameras and exactly. whatever. They would just need like a firmware update or Right. Uh, you got to be able to turn it on, which is questionably illegal at this point in some context anyway. So you get to that point. Then you get to the point like 10 years later where that is commonplace. Every car can do it. Like, you know, probably within 10 years, every car will be able to keep itself from crashing. Like you will be able to turn on it and unless something it can't see happens, which certainly is still possible on a real road, but generally avoidable accidents will be avoided. And so then the layer, then you have to get it to where everyone can afford it, which could either be like massively incentivized the way we had under Obama, the all the green incentives to make Nissan Leafs free, something like that happens. And then you get to the point where you, you know, you can't, uh, you're not allowed to in certain areas that incentivize that. And so yeah. uh, it's interesting because Volvo just came out with this stance that none of their cars are going to go more than 112 miles an hour. And Funny number. Greatest response, I've got to assume it's Is it something kilometers? in kilometers. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah it's probably 100 and uh, maybe. Uh, 160, 170 no, it's more than 100, it's less than 150, I don't know. But, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the... Uh, the the best response that I saw to that idea was somebody on Twitter that said, well, how fast will it let you go with the seatbelt unbuckled? Because certainly some people die from speeding, but way more people die from not wearing their seatbelts. And so if you're going to say that we're making cars safe by regulating their speed, saying that it won't go over 10 miles an hour with the seatbelt unbuckled would be the perfect way to do that. And so totally. I, you know, I think some people are taking these really unique approaches in terms of how they solve problems, but they aren't thinking about the most logical ones. Like nobody's going to say, I won't buy a Volvo because it won't let me speak. It won't let me drive with my seatbelt unbuckled. They're going to realize, all right, this is, I, I got to buckle my seatbelt. But plenty of people are going to not buy them because they won't go over 112 miles an hour. That's true. That's yeah. very true. Yeah. And it, I, I was actually going to bring that up if you didn't, because it, it is one of those big steps that's kind of coming into play 
uh, you know, in iRobot, you know, there's that scene where Will Smith takes control and the other girl freaks out. You know, what are you doing? What are you doing driving this fast? You can't be responsible. But, you know, it's going to be once we introduce all this autonomy and the new technology and stuff, it's going to come with its own set of problems and there's still going to be deaths that happen. Right. And so then it's the question of, you know, right now it's okay, whoever's operating the vehicle is at fault. Now who's at fault? Is it the guy who owns the car? Is it the insurance company? Is it the car company? You know, who is at fault for these accidents? You know, is it the whoever programmed the system? Like it's all very, very, um, you know, there's a lot of problems that are going to arise. And I think also coming up with some sort of system where, where cars can talk to each other, almost kind of like an open source language of right. sorts like it you know because otherwise you run into the issue that private planes had you know back in the 80s and early 90s there were just tons of private aircraft being built and they were you know it was a big burgeoning industry and they were expensive but you could think about owning a plane then they started tying deaths that occurred in private aircraft back to the manufacturers eternally like there was no limitation of liability. Hmm. And Congress had to step in eventually and say like, in order for us to save this industry, we have to, st we have to limit the liability of these uh, entities. And it's, it's gotten to where it's, it's starting to be more manageable, but the industry suffered for so long that it's now, you know, so you have to be such a baller to have a private aircraft that it, it's not even a thing people think about. So it yeah. just it's it just took it out of people's consideration and probably set us back a considerable amount of time in terms of how far a human can on their own accord travel uh, within a, so a short period of time. So you never know how it's going to trickle out, and you know I think it'll be entertaining if not occasionally disheartening as a consumer of a product that we love in cars that to see it kind of be you know torn limb from limb and then rebuilt into something we don't yet understand yeah it is it is a weird world we're living in obviously but yeah it's it's very scary as like you know someone who likes to drive cars and is you know enthralled by this world it's kind of it's kind of sad to know that in the future our you know maybe our kids won't care as much about cars or won't have the experiences we had but also that just goes with any generational increase. Like, you know, people always look fondly on the past, but also, you know, people, I don't personally care that I don't, I don't own a ton of books. Maybe my grandfather's like, oh, these kids never will know what it's like to own a library full of books. But I'm like, I've got a phone in my pocket, dude. Like, I don't, I don't really care. And so it's kind of sad to see it go, but it's also one of those things that just, you know, it's just a sign of the times, I guess. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, it's possible that a, mo a lot of, you know, probably not, I've got a four-year-old and uh, I'm glad they're still teaching handwriting. I'm not entirely sure why, but, you know, <laughs> uh, people, yeah, it's true. you know, at, uh, at a very short time horizon aren't going to actually need to be able to write letters. They're going to need to be able to pick them out and type them. It's true. And, or, or just speak them or think them or something like that. And so the, the ways the world can change, I think we'd be naive to say that we have any clue exactly how it's going to manifest. And you know, we were so close, I think, with the initial rise of cryptocurrency to completely reinventing the world monetary system. And I think that is a disruption opportunity. I don't think that was the perfect execution of it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, <laughs> you have to watch out for, you know, how useful is this to criminals when you think of something that's disruptive? But it, uh, it definitely it didn't take off the way that I know a lot of people wanted it to. But it's, you know, it's going to be a, it'll be a strange thing. I mean, global Wi-Fi will be the next thing that really changes mm. the way we engage with the internet. However that gets implemented, whether it's just through 5G on your phone and just easy tethering to all your devices that just eliminates so much in terms of television subscriptions and, you know, obviously wired in internet, fiber internet, all the things that we've enjoyed so far. If you get to that level of access, then none of it really matters. Mm -hmm. And you know, what are the implications of giving the internet freely to every human being on Earth? You know, what does that look like for you know the developing world? Yeah, and one of the things that you know has come up a lot recently. I know I listened to a podcast that Joe Rogan did with uh, I think his name's Andrew Yang. He's like running for president, mm. um, and he was talking about you know this idea that. In the very near future, a lot of autonomous stuff and robots and whatever are going to take all our jobs and whatever. But 
it's actually true. Like he wasn't being, you know, uh, sensational about it. He was being realistic about the fact that, you know, a lot of high school educated people and even college educated people in America are going to have to face the facts that their jobs are going to get like eventually replaced. And he was talking about this idea of universal basic income, which, you know, on the surface seems very distasteful and kind of weird and kind of whale fairy and you know it feels like oh the government's you know doing too much and where's that money all going to come from but right. you know it's like if if you're if you're a trucker you know your job is in jeopardy like pretty quickly unfortunately and which is actually a good thing because every trucking company is now struggling to hire truck drivers yeah uh, so it's you know sometimes the that you know, chicken egg problem happens a little bit differently, mm -hmm. but the hope always is that with technological development, there is a benefit to society that helps to cope with the fact that this is now not a job. And so the hope would be that because it is now cheaper to farm, cheaper to manufacture, cheaper to ship, cheaper to do a lot of things, I don't need as much money to buy the goods that I need in order to live and enjoy my life. So if that becomes the case, then the elimination of jobs, the reduction in workforce won't be as, a, as strong an impact because rather than feeling like you, know, you have to make X, you can make Y and have the same quality of life. And so that would be the hope and that that would, that, you know, it won't be that we have to give everybody the same amount of money. We'll have to recognize that they are sufficiently wealthy with less money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like you're kind of a, a, a scoff law in a lot of ways that I feel like you probably, more than the average Joe, respects the lack of regulation in some of course, aspects. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm on the and, you know, anarchist side of conservative uh, political <laughs> ideology. <laughs> Yeah, definitely a little more uh, open borders as far as a lot of this kind of stuff, which right. I would agree with uh, for a lot of things. I mean, I think that um, the market sorts itself out a lot of times, but, you know, sometimes people got to step in. Um, oh, sure. But, yeah, it's kind of like with, with cars right now, it's still kind of like, you know, it's not the wild, wild west anymore, but it, it, it it's... I'm sure people looking back on these times will kind of look at them that way. Kind okay. of the same way with drones, you know, now there's a lot of regulations, but you know, when it's just enthusiasts that were building their own stuff, you right. know, that you know, you could fly anywhere and no one would even really know what's going on, but now, you know, everyone's worried about what's going to happen or crashing, stuff like that. It's just very fascinating to, you know, see where where that line between society and government and enthusiasts and everything falls exactly and like you know my wife and i were talking the other day because a lot of my son's four-year-old peers are already starting foreign language training hmm. and i was like there's nothing wrong with anyone wanting to speak another language except for the fact that it will never be as good at translating as your phone is now <laughs> And so if I can set this phone here and you can speak another language and I can just look at it and know what you said, reading it in whatever my native language is, then, you know, why do I need to speak your language? I mean, I understand it changes a little bit of the bond we could have, but it's not like most people are doing this for networking. They're doing it because it's a functional job skill. Mm -hmm. And if that is free via Google or whoever at any point, then... Why, why do we need to spend so much of our time and energy trying to learn something that everyone who's ever done it acknowledges one of the hardest things in the world to learn? Yeah. Just so that it can work? Like Yeah. Gary Vaynerchuk talks about how like right now in history is like the worst it like knowing things is has the least amount of value. Right. Like actually knowing things or memorizing facts or whatever is completely almost useless because you know, unless you're on a game show or something. Because right. that was, I mean, like, think about how crazy game shows popular they were back in the day. Because, holy crap, this guy knows everything. Now it's not that impressive because it's like, right. dude, I can just, like, who cares if you know that off the top of your head? Right. Because I can just look it up or whatever. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, again, it's a sign of the times. But it, it's definitely one of the, it, it, everyone has, you know, 24 hours in a day. If you want to spend that, you know, learning a new language or, you know, right. obsessing over cars or, you know, figuring out certain things, you know, that's your own prerogative. But, you know, there's there's always going to be things that are worth it and not. And, you know, I think one of these things, like you were saying with Volvo limiting the speed of their cars, it's like, well, is that really the root problem? Are we really trying to save lives or are we just trying to, on paper, make it look safer or, you know, um, make parents want to buy the car more or whatever it ends up being? Because, you know, there's always going to be a bigger problem to solve, right? Like, you know, 
well, well, why should we care about this when there's kids starving in Africa? Or why should we care about this when we've got babies being killed because of abortion? Or, you know, all these, there's always like a bigger issue to solve. And I think that, you know, there's, there's always a noble cause and going towards whatever you want to do, but just make sure it's actually what you want to do right. because it might be useless in the next few years or whatever. Yeah, you never know. You yeah, never know. exactly. Well, I feel like this is a good place to wrap things up. Sorry to leave everyone on a kind of bleak, <laughs> bleak uh, image of the future, but hopefully we'll get to enjoy cars and everything for the, for the foreseeable future. You know? I hope so too. Yeah. I hope so well, too. Well, if people want to um, watch you or follow you or everything or anything, where, where can they, where can they <laughs> find you, Ed? Well, you can find me at Ed Bolian on just about any of the social platforms or at VinWiki on and the rest of them. We've, uh, we've tried to keep it all active, but obviously VinWiki on YouTube and would love to, uh, you know, have people come and watch, I suppose, and certainly download our app. There we go. Well, thanks for watching and listening, everybody, and uh, we'll see you later. See you. Boom. There you go. Thank you so much again to Ed for coming back on the show. Such an awesome episode. If you made it to the end, that means you enjoyed this episode. And one of the best ways that you can share this is just by screenshotting your podcast app right now and sending it to a friend or putting it on your Instagram story. That's a really quick and easy way that you can support the podcast and get this out to more people. Um, of course, make sure you go follow Ed. And if you're interested at all in what he's doing, definitely go download the VinWiki app. It's really awesome. But if, again, if you made it to the end of this episode, you probably are going to enjoy some of my other episodes. So number one, if you haven't already, go back and listen to episode 50 um, and catch up on what Ed's doing with VinWiki. And it's, it was really cool. We talked all about like his upbringing. We talked about um, founding his first car rental company out of his dorm room at Georgia Tech. Um, founding VinWiki and starting up that YouTube channel and everything. So it's really cool to see um, how everything has grown since then. And also, you would probably enjoy going back and listening to episode 108 with Steele Davis. I actually got connected to Steele because of the VinWiki channel. He was a, a one of the people on their channel sharing his car stories. But Steele's actually a professional drone pilot, and he has a YouTube channel with over uh, 200,000 subscribers. He's a really loyal fan base, but he's worked with some really crazy brands over the past couple years, and he's a professional FPV drone pilot. So he puts on these crazy goggles and flies his drones all around the world in some of the coolest locations. If you enjoyed this episode, you would definitely like to go back and listen to that one. So go check it out. That was called Professional Drone Pilot, I believe, episode 108. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to follow me on my social media accounts, you can go to my website, andrewdeitch.com and find all the links and all that kind of stuff to my social media accounts. Been doing a lot of really cool stuff on Instagram lately. Also, if you're just listening to this, you can also listen to the podcast on YouTube. You can go on YouTube and actually watch the whole thing. We've been posting a lot of cool clips um, and we're gonna continue to roll out little mini clips from each episode. So if you like YouTube, um, go, go subscribe. That's one platform that I'm really trying to grow on this year. But thank you guys so much for listening and I will see you guys in the next one. Um, I get those requests just about uh, every hour, and <laughs> so it's 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 pretty incessant. <laughs>